All right, we're getting close to the end here. Chapter 16, The Grave Diggers. They were two days finding their way to Shirt Tail Camp. They followed the South Fork of the American River into the winding Coloma Valley. The summer hills were red and yellow. They passed within 10 feet of Old Cap Sutter's sawmill. Jack heard everyone in the diggings refer to Sutter as Old Cap, and he knew the miners' yarns about the sawmill. He looked at it now, a rough, timbered shack on stilts at the water's edge. Old Cap had hired a carpenter named Jim Marshall to build it. That was the way the yarn began. A yarn is a story, like a fable, almost. On a chill January morning in 48, the carpenter spied a yellow glitter on the, tra and the trail race. He thought it might be fool's gold until he beat it with a rock. That was the test. Fool's gold was brittle and would splinter. Real gold is soft and flattens out. So they hit the gold with a rock. If it was fake, if it was fool's gold, then it would splinter. But if it's um, real gold, it's really uh, malleable. It's soft, and so it flattens. The lump flattened out like a yellow button. Marshall ro rushed off to Sacramento, where Old Cap had built a fort, and arrived in a pouring rain with the news. He made Old Cap bolt the door, pulled a white cotton rag from a pocket of his wet pantaloons, and revealed his discovery. Jim Marshall was so excited he could barely speak. The two men tried other tests. They got bowls of water and a scale. Using an equal amount of silver, they weighed the two metals under water. The gold was heavier. Then they tested the samples with acid to see if they would erode. They wouldn't. There was no longer any question about Marshall's discovery in the trail race. He had found gold. The news leaked out, and the rush for the yellow treasure began. Squatters came swarming into the valley and now a town had sprung up on both sides of the river. Jack had never seen so many long toms and rockers in his life. Is this the way a shirt tail camp? Is this the way to shirt tail camp? Praiseworthy asked a miner standing knee deep in water and mud. Just follow the river. If you hurry, you might get there in time for the hanging. A lot of boys has taken the day off for the festivities. Praiseworthy shrugged. We're in no hurry, my partner and I. It's that Dennis fella. They caught him trying to run off on a stolen horse. Praiseworthy and Jack exchanged a quick glance. The map! Only Cut-Eye Higgins knew where Dr. Buckaby's gold bonanza might be. He couldn't talk very well, hanging from a limb, much as he deserved it, no doubt. On second thought, said Praiseworthy, we're in a terrible hurry. Good day, sir. They arrived at Shirtdale Camp in an hour. It was a dusty village of round tents and square tents and plank shacks roofed in pine boughs. There, said Jack. There he is. So there he's Cut Eye Higgins hanging on the. They have the noose around his neck and he's on the horse. He saw Cut Eye Higgins seated on a house under the limb of a tree. He wore his jippa jabba hat and around his neck a noose. The scar across his eye set his face at a hard squint. A crowd was ringed around him. We're just in time, Jack murmured. Praiseworthy whipped out Stubbs' red bandana, blindfolded and quickly tied around Jack's face. Partner, you've got a toothache. What? Moan now and then. Good and loud. Come on. Jack gulped and followed Praiseworthy through the crowd. A paunchy man with a curly fringe of whiskers from ear to ear seemed to be in charge of festivities. Doc, he was saying, you know the verdict of the jury. As justice of the peace of Shirt Tail Camp, I'll see you get a good baron as befits a professional man such as yourself. We don't mind so much that you extracted a gold pouch every time we opened our mouths. There's plenty of yeller around, and that you light-fingered every pocket watch in town so that nobody knows what time it is. You're a professional man, and we tried to make allowances, but horse-stealing is a heinous crime, and you got to pay the penalty. Since you said your last words two, three times already this afternoon, let's get on with it. Boys, switch that horse. To switch the horse means to make the horse run. Hold on, demanded Praiseworthy, stepping forward. I've got a lad here with a powerful toothache. The Justice of the Peace threw down his hat. Doggone, that's the third one today. We'll never get him strung up. I beg of you, gent, said Praiseworthy. We've come a long way and it'll only take a moment. The boy is in pain. Listen to him moan. Jack bellowed and held a hand to his cheek. He wasn't pretending. He was downright scared they might let Cut-Eye Higgins pull one of his teeth. All right, said the chin-whiskered official. 
Get the dog down off that horse. Hire him, give him, give him back his forceps, and bring that molasses barrel for the boy to sit on. Jack moaned again and watched the men help cut I Higgins off the saddle. He seemed a little weak in the knees. They cut the rope binding his wrists behind his back, but left the noose around his neck. He peered from Jack to Praiseworthy. It was a moment before he recognized the butler in red shirt, jack boots, and whiskers. Never thought I'd be glad to see you again, he said. His face was pale and his usual sneer was gone. Reluctantly, Jack seated himself on the molasses barrel and the doomed man clapped an eye on him. Open your mouth, son, and stop squirming. Jack took one look at the steel forceps and cut-eye Higgins' shaky hand and decided that a team of mules wasn't going to get his mouth open. Let's see them ivories, cut-eye Higgins said under his breath. I'll just tinker. You don't come to me to have... To you didn't come to me to have any yanked. We came for the map, Praiseworthy muttered. I figured, get me out of this and the map is yours. Praiseworthy nodded. It's a bargain. I'll do the best I can. But first, the map. I don't trust you even with a noose around your neck. Kadai Higgins lifted off his jippa jabba hat and fished a thick folded strip of brown paper out of the sweatband. It was as if he kept it there only to make his hat fit. When he returned the hat to his head, it slipped down almost to his ears. There's my part of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Open them jaws, boy. Jack swallowed hard and opened up. The crowd watched and waited. Cut Eye Higgins wiped the forceps on his sleeve and set to work. Praiseworthy opened up the folds of brown paper, studied the markings, and within seconds he saw that the foxy scoundrel had outfoxed him again. The map traced a line along the north fork of the American River, through the Coloma Valley, and ended with an X mark that could only be Shirt Tail Camp. Why, this map is no good, snapped Praiseworthy. I didn't say it was, except to make my hat fit. But that's the map Buckaby's brother made before he died. The same, the genuine article. Only in the meantime, them pockets of gold got discovered all over again. By the time I got here, there were a hundred of miners on that spot. Jack moaned as best he could, with the forceps trying to spread his teeth apart. Their fifty-fifty share of Dr. Buckaby's mine was worthless. Cut-Eye Higgins had led them on a wild goose chase. Get me out of this noose, said Cut-Eye Higgins. That was our bargain, wasn't it? Praiseworthy ripped the map to bits. He'd given his word, and he had to stand by it. Gentlemen, he said, turning to the Justice of the Peace and others grouped around him, I'll take it you have acted as judge and jury in this case. That's right, answered the official. He got a fair trial anyway. He was caught red-handed. He was, rep was he represented by counsel? What for? We knew he was guilty. Under what law do you intend to dispatch Dog Higgins from the limb of that tree? Why, everybody knows horse-stealing is again the law. What law? Now listen here, stranger. There ain't a law book within fifty miles that I know of. I hear that I hear they had one over at Growlersburg, but it was printed on thin paper and the boys took to rolling cigarettes with it. Speaking for myself, I don't see any reason to let law interfere with justice round here. We never did before. Praiseworthy began pacing slowly back and forth. In the absence of book of the uh, in the absence of book law, Gentlemen, I recommend to your notice that humanity is also lacking in this case. You're about to string up the only dentist in these diggings. Is that human? He may deserve his face, but what of the innocent whose only crime is to come down with a toothache? Praiseworthy turned and made a grand courtroom gesture toward Jack. Like my young partner here. Think of the pain and suffering you will inflict on those in dire need of a tooth extractor. Tomorrow it may be you, sir, with your cheek swelled up like a melon, or you, sir, Mr. Justice of the Peace, with a pain in your jaw, as if you had a bee for a molar stinging away from morning till night. One by one, he singled out the gentlemen of the jury, and one by one they found themselves rubbing their jaws, as if they could almost feel a toothache coming on. Praiseworthy had never made a speech in his life, but the words rolled off his tongue and he could feel their effect on the crowd. When he finished, he was greeted with a yell of approval. He is talking sense, someone called out. The doc can't pull teeth if he's six feet under. We could put him in jail. The justice of Shirttail Camp shook his head. Boys, we ain't got a jail. You know that. The verdict was string him up, but I suppose I could delay sentence until another tooth extractor shows up in these parts. There's bound to be one before long. Then we'll get on with the sentence. There was general approval from the crowd, and two toothaches broke out on the spot. 
Praiseworthy was astonished by the power he had found in his voice. The two miners got in line at the molasses barrel, and Jack was glad to give up his place. My tooth has stopped hurting, he said, and Cut Eye Higgins gave him a wink with his bad eye. Doc Higgins, said the Justice of the Peace, you got yourself a temporary reprieve. When you finish with them extraction jobs, you stand still. We're going to build a jailhouse around you. There'll be visiting hours for anyone with the toothache, but I'll see you hung yet, and soon as possible. Then he turned to Praiseworthy. Stranger, I promised the doc a good burying, befitting a professional man. Might as well get all in readiness. Since you appointed yourself counsel for the defense, you get up the hills and dig him a resting place. Make it six feet deep. Why six feet? Don't be cantankerous or I'll find you for being in contempt of court. Everybody knows a grave has got to be six feet deep. Get going. The two partners returned to their burrow and led him into the hills above the diggings. You sure made a good speech, Jack said. It was something to hear. A regular lawyer couldn't have done better. And you saved Cut Eye Higgins from being strung up. It's just temporary, which is about all that he deserves. They chose a bare spot about a half a mile from camp. It was on a bluff covered with oat straw and overlooking the river. They pulled pick and shovel from Stubb's pack, ropes, and set to work. Fine-looking country, isn't it? Praiseworthy muttered, even to be buried in. Jack tried not to think about Boston. It would be soon be it would soon be time to start back, and all they had to show for their labors with the worst was a worthless map. Poor Aunt Arabella, he thought. They would lose the house for sure. The entire trip to California was beginning to look like a wild goose chase. When they got the hole, when they got the hole four feet deep, they couldn't go any further. They hit bedrock and struck gold.